morning. My name is Reverend Brandon Dirks. I'm an associate minister of missions here. It's my uh, honor and pleasure to be with you today and to preach for you today. Um, our, uh, I would ask for prayers to our senior pastor, Reverend Randy Harry. He's on vacation, but during his vacation, he got a cold. And um, so you can hardly rest when you have a cold. But uh, So we wish you well, Randy. I know you're watching. Um, and uh, pray for me, if you would. Uh, would you uh, join me in a prayer? Gracious God, may no one hear these words of mine because they are hearing your word. And may that word take root in our hearts. And may it grow and bear fruit for your kingdom here in this community and around the world. In your son's name I pray. Amen. So in 1973, in 1973, my family moved to a small rural town with a population of about 3,000. It's, it's located about five miles north of Hickory, North Carolina, not too far from here, about an hour and a half. We lived there for about 40, 45 years, and there's really nothing special about this town. Although it, it, it is on the Catawba River, uh, it's still a small town. You wouldn't know it if you saw it. Uh, you blink your eyes, you're through it. But by... But about 10 years ago, a reporter from USA Today came to that town and made our town famous because the name of this small rural town just happens to be Bethlehem. And we, too, had a Bethlehem star. Each year, just after Thanksgiving, this entire community would gather around this in a grassy spot in the middle of town. Now, don't get too excited about this grassy spot. Um, that is pretty much the center of town. It was at a stoplight. On one side was the post office. On the other side was a boat shop. That's the town. But on this one day at the beginning of Advent, just after Thanksgiving, the town would gather for this event. And at this place, they would set up a live nativity scene, a live nativity scene with with animals and with characters, uh, with neighbors dressed up as Joseph and the wise men and, and different characters and, and families. I know my family would be embarrassed by my dad always trying to get us to stand inside the stable to take a family picture. And he would ask the characters if we could borrow their costumes <laughs> every year. It's a good thing I don't have a way to show you those pictures today. At that event, kids would be running around all over the place because it's a big grassy area. And then they'd back in a, a, a big flatbed truck and put up on the back of the flatbed truck a local bluegrass band that would sing and lead us in Christmas carols. And then the air, you could just sense the air was filled with the aroma of powdered chocolate milk. You know the smell I'm talking about. And we waited. And darkness would begin to fall, and our waiting became more and more anxious when finally the mayor of Bethlehem would climb up on the stage, I mean the flatbed truck, and begin a countdown from 10, 10, 9, 8, all the way to 1. And when he got to 1, at the top of a nearby telephone pole, a huge 30-foot star lined with light bulbs would instantly Come on. Well, most of the light bulbs would come on. And silence fell on the crowd for just an instant. And then the cheer would arise. It was truly an awesome moment and an awesome memory for me of how a community year after year would still gather Beneath the star of Bethlehem, Bethlehem, North Carolina. And my family never missed a year. For over 40 years, the star lighting of Bethlehem would gather hundreds and on occasional a thousand people. And what I've discovered is so special, not only about the Bethlehem star, but also the Christmas star 
that still beacons and calls people to come and discover the Christ child and to make a journey of faith. Today's scripture, today's scripture ushers into the Christian season, the season of epiphany, which means to show or to make known or to reveal or to discover. You know, the Magi traveled long distances following the star of Bethlehem in hopes of discovering and worshiping the newborn king of the Jews. But what they found was so much more. How, how many of you have figurines in your nativity scenes at home of the wise men? How many you have? It's okay. You can raise your hand. Nobody will look at you if you have them. Yeah, we, I've got all of ours here. My wife reluctantly let me borrow them because she knows I will drop them, and they're made of porcelain. So I see here. So I'm just going to set them here. Maybe I won't knock them over. Yeah, now you're nervous. <laughs> Did, yeah, it's tempting. But most of your nativity scenes would have three wise men. Or they would all have, sometimes they would have crowns. These wise men are older. They're carrying treasures. They're dressed ornately. This is the way they're typically portrayed in nativity scenes. But it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that the English translation of Magi over the years has settled on wise men. Magi were simply a priestly class, a priestly class of Persian or Babylonian experts. Now, you know ministers. You rarely would cause, uh, call us wise men, right? But these priests of the, uh, in the, those days were priests in the occult, probably astrology. They were certainly not wise by any scientific standards, nor were they kings. That's a designation that the Emperor Constantine um, gave them in the 4th century in hopes of validating his claim that all the kings of the earth should come and kneel before him to pay him homage like the Magi. So take a closer look. It's okay, you can open your Bibles here. But take a closer look at the scripture in Matthew 2. Look at verse 1 and 2. Look at it really close. The Magi were certainly not kings. They were definitely not wise. There were not necessarily three of them. And perhaps not necessarily men. We just don't know. The, despite our hymn's title, We Three Kings of Orient Are, it's just simply not validated in the scriptures. The magi were just simply magi. However, the significance of the magi in being in this story is clear. Matthew makes a radical point, especially if you were a first century Jewish hearer of this story. These magi are pagans. They're, they're Gentiles. They are outsiders. And though they have no special, re, special revelation from the Torah, they still come to Jerusalem compelled to follow the only light that they have seen. In other words, although Jesus comes as the Jewish Messiah, Jesus' birth signifies the fulfillment of Gentile hopes as well. I thought that was a pretty good statement. Are you all paying attention? Just like the Magi, all of us are on a quest for an authentic life. We all feel like outsiders looking for something looking for something, something more, some, something real, something with more meaning, some kind of purpose to our lives. And we may even look to unbiblical or anti-biblical ways to fulfill that, like astrology or alcohol or drugs or sex or success or money or status. 
No matter what quest you are on, Matthew's point is clear. You will never be satisfied until you find yourself bowing before this baby, this baby Jesus, this God made real, and offer all that you are. You see, these magi saw an astral phenomenon, best described as a, as a star, and they instantly knew what it meant. Outsiders. And they were compelled to travel a great distance to find out what it's all about. And they come to Jerusalem. The star led them first to Jerusalem. No doubt because that's the center of the Jewish faith. And while they were there, they asked where the Messiah had been born. And oddly, in the center of Jewish life, Jerusalem, oddly, no one seems to know. No one knew? Jerusalem is just five miles from Bethlehem, and no one else saw this star? You mean to tell me that the Gentile magi, the outsiders, from a hundred miles away, or hundreds of miles away, and not from the religious faithful, were the only ones to see the star and understand what it meant that be a metaphor for life today? Their search took them all the way to King Herod, who gathered all his scribes and priests to figure out what's going on. Well, if these magi, if what these magi is telling us is true, what are the probable locations of the Messiah's birth? And the answer comes from an obscure text from Micah revealing that the Christ child would be born in Bethlehem of Judea. Isn't that interesting? Herod, king of the Jews, current king of the Jews, really didn't know his own scripture? And then, as the Magi set out for Bethlehem, the star leading the way to the very spot where Jesus was, did you notice where Jesus was? Look in verse 11. He wasn't in a stable. He wasn't in a manger. He was in a house. And it was at this house where the Magi immediately found him and knelt in worship. And they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You see, what's interesting to me about this story is that the Magi, the outsiders, had the eyes to see and follow the star, but that would only get them so far. They still needed more. They still needed help. They needed guidance. They needed guidance from the scriptures of faith. I wonder if that's still a metaphor for today. Maybe we still need guidance from the scriptures of faith. Now let's talk about the star. Scientists for over the centuries have tried to explain this astral phenomenon as Halley's Comet, which was visible in 12 BC, or, or the convergence of Jupiter and Saturn, which occurred in 7 BC, or a supernova of a star that has never been recorded. Some have even conjectured that it might have been a UFO. But one thing is clear. The star of Bethlehem is really not about science. It's about the search for something. The search for meaning. Matthew is clearly describing a miraculous phenomenon directed by the, behind the scenes by God himself. And the star does something interesting. The star remains stationary while in Jerusalem, then leads them not only to Bethlehem, but to the precise location of Jesus, where it stood still to mark the spot. 
in verse 9. No ordinary star could do such a thing. But what fascinates me is not the science of the star, but the purpose of it. The star is simply an invitation to come and discover God. What if the star of Bethlehem is really a beacon? that calls people to come and discover Jesus, not just for the Magi from the East, but for all outsiders, for all who are searching, for all who are desperate, for all who long for something more. So where is this beacon today? Where is this beacon today that compels believers to come with their gifts and worship at the foot of the Christ child? Let me suggest something. Let me suggest that the star of Bethlehem continues to burn brightly in you, in me, in all of us in the church. The church, yes, with its flaws and its imperfections, the church still points to people to the Christ child, still calls people to bring their gifts in service to the Messiah, and still worships at the foot of Jesus. The body of Christ, like the bright star of Bethlehem, offers hope to the people who are lost in darkness. The church, illumined by Jesus himself, is the light of the world. And each one of us, each believing Christian, carries a spark of that light. And combined together, we form a glorious star that illumines this dark world and beckons people to gather beneath in worship. Now, I know what you're thinking. I'm thinking the same thing. But the church has so many problems. How can it be the beacon? How can it be the star? With our problems and our battles over power and status, concerns over theological positions, fights over the color of the walls, the times and types of worship, parking spaces, new buildings, old furniture, additional properties, programs, etc., etc. With all of these problems, how can the church be the beacon that brings people to Christ? Wait for it. This is good. Well, the church may not be perfect, but Christ is. And you don't have to be perfect to point to what is perfect. I see no one writing that down. That was really, really good. You don't have to be perfect to point to what is perfect. But don't confuse the church with the bricks and the mortar and the fellowship hall and the sanctuary, not even the pews that you're sitting in. Far too many people have worshiped the building and neglected the call to be the star for others. This building is a beautiful place to gather an elegant testimony to the sacrifices of hundreds of believers for decades and stands as a witness to the faith of so many. But the building is not the church. Even if this building disappeared tomorrow, I am convinced that the star of Christ would still burn brightly in the people called Providence United Methodist Church. The church is the people of Christ. 
from every little child to every youth, to every young adult, to every grown adult, to every guest who wanders in, to every person participating online, to every homebound person. This church is you and me and all of us together. The church is also more than this local church, more than Providence United Methodist, and we're more than any denomination. It encompasses all believers of Christ all around the world and throughout all the centuries. 2,000 years ago, the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us in the person of Jesus. And so now the person of Christ continues to dwell among us as the church in you and me. That is why we are called the body of Christ. You, we, are the Bethlehem star. Y'all, this is good. But I want to give you a warning. I want you to be careful to not get something confused. The church is not the same thing as Christ. The church is not the same thing as Christ. Too many of us believe that inviting people to church is the same thing as introducing them to Jesus. It's not. I've seen, I've seen way too many people who, are dedicated, who have a dedicated relationship to the church but still lack the transforming relationship with Christ. Oh, they may look the part on Sundays, but do they on Mondays? much less Fridays. Have you ever thought to yourself, well, I go to church. I'm a good person. I must be okay. Well, here's the truth. The church, the church never was born in a manger, never saved anyone from their sins, never was resurrected leaving an empty tomb, and never will sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty only Jesus saves. Only Jesus transforms us into new creations. Only Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Only Jesus is the Lamb of God. But it's the church in all our imperfections that is the star that continues to call people to bring their gifts, to kneel down, and to worship before Jesus. So if you see the giving of your gifts, the giving of your time in teaching Sunday school or leading a small group, your dollars in the offering plate, your talents or music or baking or leading a committee or walking with our youth or children in discipleship or any, num num any other number of amazing ministries in the church, solely as your obligation, a duty, as something you are supposed to do instead of an act of worship to the Christ child. You've totally missed what it means to be the Bethlehem star, to be the church. So with this new year, I want to invite you. I want to actually challenge you, really, to transform your understanding of the meaning of the church from an organization to an organism, from an institution, yes, that might have some problems, to a living and breathing being that strives to love and embrace and comfort and admonish and exist to be a beacon for all, to discover the transforming grace of Jesus Christ in their lives. So can we? It's a big question. So can we, once and for all, find a way to work together to become the people, to become a people where the star of Bethlehem is raised high up overhead 
so that people of all ages and all beliefs and all issues and all places of life can end their long and desperate and lonely search and finally find hope in this world. Can this be a place where our neighbors will point to and go, if you want to find life, you will find it there. If you're looking for meaning and if you're looking for purpose, I know the place. It's at 2810 Providence Road. If you're looking for help, if you're looking for healing, if you're looking for purpose, I know the people to introduce you to. If you're looking for the King of Kings, if you're looking for the Lord of Lords, if you're looking for the Prince of Peace, if you're looking for the incarnate God, if you're looking for Emmanuel, the Son of the living God, if you're looking for Jesus of the Christ, it's here. Can we? Can we? truly become the Bethlehem star? Let us pray. Most holy and gracious God, we stop for just a moment to praise you for all that you are, for loving us so much that you sent your son into this world. We lived taught, died, and was resurrected so that this world might have hope and life. And you've called the church to be bearers of that light. Come once again to Providence United Methodist Church. Make us into the people you need us to be so that this dark world might have the light of Christ.